Hi everybody, John Jagerson here. So why don't we jump in and get started. I've just been previewing some of the questions that have come in so far. Not a lot actually. So uh, we may have some extra time if you've got uh, questions that have been overlooked in the past a little bit, chime in. As usual, I like to give everybody a heads up. The reason why we do this is to be able to answer questions, but I always like to start out with a little bit of a preface, what's going on in the market. And I want to be able to uh, answer a... Uh, question I've been getting quite a bit. It, it, what can we do about a rising dollar? And and I think that, that, that it's uh, there's a lot of confusion around what is causing the dollar to do this because, you know, I would say I think that where a lot of this confusion comes from is that we know that the dollar is uh, inflating or rather it is its purchasing power is being affected because of inflation, and yet you'll read in the news that the dollar is getting stronger, 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 stronger. Both of those things are true because there's a difference between the dollar's purchasing power and the uh, dollar uh, relative to other currencies. So we can take advantage of that as investors. And there are ways to do that, of course, in the currency market. And I've got some convenient ways that you can do that. that got a couple of suggestions, I think, that you can do that in uh, even using ETFs. Uh, they can be a little tricky, so I'll explain that here in a second. As well as... There are ways, now this is again, this is going to be kind of a risky adventurous strategy, but there are ways to use the fact that the dollar is spiking like it is to ramp up, give you a better opportunity to the downside. So again, a little bit of strategic diversification. This is kind of like the conversation we had last Monday where you know the market was looking pretty bad. So how do we take advantage of that? Well, it's okay once in a while to dabble. We've got to be careful, but to dabble in on the, the downside. And this would be one way to use a strengthening dollar in favor of some downside bets. And I have some specific suggestions that uh, that I think you might uh, uh, be interested in. Okay, so I see some questions coming in. These are excellent. Keep them coming. Uh, while those are being written up, I'm just going to take, let's do a real quick market overview. I got to tell you, when the market is crashing like it has been the last three days, there's really not a lot that you can point to as far as, because everything's going the same direction. All assets are selling off. Uh, I think that it's it's very likely to me that um, a catalyst here that we're dealing with is a, a anxiety around the inflation report tomorrow, moderately. And of course, the Fed is coming up on Wednesday. Now, just in case you missed it, so I'm going to summarize this really quick. So just in case you missed it, uh, the Fed right now, so there's the Fed funds target rate. So I'm just going to call it the FF uh, TR. So the Fed funds target rate, this is the overnight rate that banks charge each other for loans. So right now that is at 0.75 to 1%. Uh, so that is the Fed funds target rate. Now, way back in the day, they, the Fed did not manage the, that rate so tight. So, it, I mean, they would set like a target, but it could fluctuate quite a bit. But since the Greenspan era, so that's basically since 1987. So uh, after 1987, the Fed kind of really started to zero in on, we're going to manage this overnight rate. And they have a lot of market power to be able to do that. So if you've ever wondered what FOMC stands for, it's the Fed Open Market Committee. The, and, and they are doing open market activities. Every day they are out there trading bonds. So they are giving supply or taking supply based on which way do they need to move that overnight rate. So that's their target right now. And what we've been expecting, and uh, it's still the majority of investors still think this. So, and, and I'll explain how I know the majority thinks this here in a second. So what we think is going to happen on Wednesday is that they will raise the, the target rate by 50 basis points. If you've heard that expression, but you don't know what a basis point is, a basis point is one one hundredth of a percentage. So if they were going to raise the rate by half a percentage point, that's 50 basis points. So we'd be looking at an increase in the Fed funds rate uh, on Wednesday from uh, 1.25 to 1.75. So uh, I'm sorry, that's not right. Uh, 1.5. I'm going to erase that. 1.5. I was talking and writing at the same time. Okay, so 1.5%, so something like that. So that, that's what we've been expecting. However, today, what I think sent everybody into panic mode was we had some notable analysts who I might mention their track record is terrible as far as predicting what the Fed actually does or does not do, but let's set that aside. We had some notable analysts out saying, you know what? 
the Fed might raise rates by 75 basis points because the, their argument is, and this is not unreasonable, their argument is uh, the Fed is going to want to come out in, in force to say we are, we are really fighting inflation. So what if they raised it by 75 basis points or even by a full percentage point, by 100 basis points? Could they do it? Yeah. The last time that they did that was 1984, but they could do it. Uh, they, and they've raised it by two full percentage is, as well in 1981. And 1981 and 1984 were bad years for the market, but they've done it. Uh, and it's, it's ostensibly to fight inflation. That's why they did it at the time. The inflation levels were way beyond their target. It seems very unlikely that they will actually change that. The Fed's mode over the last 20 years has been to clearly telegraph to the market what they're going to do and then do that. The only time they wind up surprising the market over the last few decades has been to cut rates unexpectedly fast. Now, uh, the, by which I don't mean to say that they cut it by a full percentage point or something like that where the market wasn't expecting it, but that they'll have intermarket uh, or inter intermeeting cuts. So they'll do it kind of unexpectedly. They don't do it very often, but they do do it sometimes. When there's like a, a credit crisis. So if you think about 2007, 2008, that's what they were doing then. 2003, uh, that's what they were doing then. So they are 2001 as well. They, they did that a couple of times, but it, it's, it's pretty rare. So they, they will do it to the downside, but not to the upside, or they have not done it to the upside. I think the probability of this is pretty low. So this implies that if I'm right about that, that on Wednesday, if investors are kind of pricing in this risk, which I, I think that's a lot of what they were doing. So they were pricing in some of this risk, therefore the S&P, so we're looking at the S&P 500 right now. So it, it, they're pricing in some of this risk, this gets into a feedback loop and prices crash, everything gets correlated. There's nothing going counter trend, really notable anyway. So everything's just crashing at the same time. If, if one of the key factors here is this expectation Potentially, the uh, the Fed might raise the rate by 0.75 or, or one or a full one percent. Then that that would that would kind of explain the panic move here. And I have to say that when we talk about traders and what they expect, there's stock traders who are very erratic, and then there are bond traders who are a lot more uh, reasoned, mostly. So it, bond traders, how we know what they think is we can look at how they're pricing bonds, which includes implicit different uh, inflation implicit uh, inflation expectations so if they it, it, so in other words right now even at the close of market we still bond traders who they it's a larger market they tend to be right way more often than stock traders do that's for sure they're still in this range so it's kind of setting us up for potentially a positive surprise on Wednesday now I don't want to get ahead of myself here but um, but that is uh, I'd say I would wait to take any action until the announcement actually comes out. But when the, once the announcement actually is released on Wednesday, I wouldn't be surprised if we had a, uh, a very positive reaction as the Fed does not resort to the worst case scenario by hiking the rate by a full percentage point. It is, I have to admit, it is a possibility. They definitely can do it. There's nothing that would stop them from doing it. But it seems very unlikely uh, if we look at Fed policy over the last couple of decades. They just don't do that. They did in the early 80s, but they haven't done that since. So it seems it seems fairly unlikely. I had a lot of questions about that, so I wanted to kind of address it right up front. Now, from a technical perspective, this is kind of interesting because I, I've mentioned, I've, I had a lot of questions about, well, how far do you think that the market is going to drop? Uh, when I was asked that question over the weekend, my response was, well, you know, for right now, tentatively, I'm still thinking that 3,900 was probably support. So that got broken, I mean, just plowed through. Hence the news. I think the news was the catalyst here. So it plowed right through. Uh, from a technical perspective, can we make some estimates, at least in the short term, as to how far we think the market's going to drop? And one of the things I always do, it, I usually apply it to the upside. So, And I just use a Fibonacci retracement. So, so let, let me give you an example of this. So I'll take my Fibonacci retracement and I'll apply it from the, the counter trend move that happened. Uh, so this is going back to last year. This is the last big one. It was in the third quarter, uh, overlapping into the fourth. No, yeah, no, fourth quarter. So fourth quarter counter trend move. And that if I measure that using a Fibonacci retracement, then we look at fee, which is a 61.8% retracement or 
a target, and that would have that would have given me a target right up here, which uh, that would turn out to be pretty much exactly where it stopped. So so right about there. Now we can do the same thing to the downside. So let me show you. So let's say, for instance, that we were to measure this most recent counter trend move, which would have been, assuming that we're now in a bearish trend, right? Which is, I think, safe to say, that I'm measuring the move that happened from February through March, and that would give me a downside projection down here at 38.68. So that's basically where the market went. So, you know, give or take a little bit. So it would have said, this is your target. And I, I know I'm treading on some ground we've already covered, so I, I don't want to rehash this completely, but that's why we would have come up with one of those projection levels that we discussed a couple of weeks ago. So now, what, what about now? What's our projection level to the downside now? Using the same, can we use the same tool? Yes. Uh, let me just clean up my chart here just a little bit. And I'm gonna, all right, so I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. So if we were to do that same thing, and it's, it works really well. It's been a very reliable tool for me. Uh, you know, everything has an error rate, but uh, okay, so I'm gonna go from, a, I usually pick about the mid price of the lows to about the mid price of the highs. And that gives me, so we're at that initial target right now. So if, if we were applying that same rule of thumb currently, I would say this seems to be where the market stopped today, the most likely area where we might get a temporary bounce, even if it's a day or two where we would find some support. So if, if I had been trying to make an estimate based on, okay, just assume that the market's gonna drop below 3,900, which it did, uh, where would your target be? And it would have been here about 3,750, at least short term. So it's right about there. I wouldn't be shocked if we saw investors uh, at least pause here. Now, uh, I, I don't think I would get aggressively bullish yet until we get more data in. Uh, PPI, produce, the producer price index, is coming out tomorrow. Uh, don't hold your breath that we get any good news. It'll probably look like CPI did last week. And um, uh, so not necessarily super negative, but n not giving us any, any uh, you know, big ups, any big positive surprises. I would wait until Wednesday. So even if the market pauses tomorrow, I wouldn't interpret that as bullish yet until we actually get the Fed out of the way. If, however, and I think we have to be clear-eyed about this, so I don't think that the Fed is going to do anything drastic. I really think that that is very unlikely. But what I think and what the market actually does are, are oftentimes two different things, as we all know. And so how far, how bad do we think that it could, that it could get? And I think... I think it is possible if the Fed got really aggressive, we would drop all the way back down to the 2020 highs. So that's 33.97. I think that's probably our worst case scenario right now. That would be a drawdown in the market in a non-recession, which is weird, uh, the, as, as deep as we've had in most bear markets outside of 2007, 2008. So the, the, that, but that is where I think we have the most compelling uh, technical level to, to look out for. So if it were... I would say the most likely catalyst that might create that worst case scenario would be the Fed uh, making a move, a really unexpectedly high price hike in on Wednesday. Again, I think it's unlikely, but if if that happens and the market drops big, I will probably head down quite a bit. I think it would exceed our expectations. So 3,400 starts to look more realistic. Okay, so in the meantime, you'll notice everything's selling off, right? So everything's selling off because interest rates are going up, driven by inflation expectations, uh, except one thing. So in a market crisis, so we, I think we're in one right now. It's not like it's not like the credit crisis, but it's bad. So in a market crisis, the asset that tends to go up in an environment like this is the U.S. dollar. Now, by which I mean, and, and we have to differentiate this again. So there's purchasing power, which is going down. That's not what I'm talking about. It's the dollar relative to other currencies. So one of the ways that you can evaluate this, this is a futures contract here. So this is the dollar versus a basket of other currencies. So uh, so you can look at this as, let's see. So we've got um, uh, the US dollar, and I'm gonna draw my little seesaw here again for a second, okay? So we have the US dollar, and then we've got a basket of other currencies, uh, largely the Euro, uh, the Japanese yen, uh, Swiss franc, um, the British pound, sterling, so forth and so on. So they're all over on this side and it's trade weighted. So as if the dollar gets stronger, so you kind of think about it as if the dollar is stronger, it's beefier, it's stronger, right? So it's heavier, it's going to tilt that seesaw down and it's going, so it will make this trend 
the trend of this instrument, it will make it positive. That's what's going on right now. The dollar is getting stronger. It's bulking up <laughs> relative to other currencies, or, or maybe they are uh, just getting weaker and lighter. And therefore, the, the either way, that seesaw is tipping up like this or up like this. So it is moving in favor of a stronger dollar. And we're kind of creeping up around the, the extreme highs that we got last uh, in um, uh, mid-May. So what causes that? Well, so think about this yourself. If you, uh, which hopefully none of you do this, but if you got really panicked, so really, really panicked about investing in general, what would you do? I mean, you'd probably sell everything, right? So that's what's going on. And then, and then what would you do? Well, you'd probably buy the safest, uh, stablest, re on a relative basis here, uh, asset that is liquid. And that's the dollar, that's the US dollar. And, and it has been for a long, long time, probably will be for a long time to come. Maybe not forever, obviously, but, uh, but that is the case right now. So what's happening is that basically investors are buying dollar deposits. They're not buying things in dollars, they are buying dollar deposits and they are selling their currencies in order to do that. So that, that's driving the value of the dollar higher. Can you take advantage of it? And you can. There are some tricks to this, however. So one, you could certainly uh, trade currencies, which is uh, uh, beyond the scope of what we can cover today. Uh, but there are spot dealers that will, you can trade currencies with. And, uh, th and that, that tends to, that, that can work pretty well. But, um, uh, but the, there are other things that you can do as well. So um, because a, a lot of currencies are available through uh, ETFs. So let me give you the, probably the most direct route, but there is a little bit of a trap here. So I think on a short-term basis, actually, I've got it up already. On a short-term basis, this worked pretty well. This is uh, UUP, this is the symbol here, uh, UUP. And it, ba oops, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, UUP, and it basically, what it does is it replicates the return of the dollar futures chart that I was just showing you. However, uh, because it's a futures or a derivative backed ETF, the it is um, uh, it it has a, a lot what we call a large indexing error, meaning that it doesn't track as well as you would think uh, the value of the underlying asset is supposed to. Uh, most of the time, indexing error is not in your favor, and that is true with UUP. So it's not a very effective instrument for long term trades, but it is good for swing trading. So when, when I see the dollar doing what it's doing right now, I always tell investors, it, the, and in this circumstance, I think this qualifies, that it's a buy on dips or breakouts. It's pretty close to a breakout currently. If it were to retrace, let's say that Wednesday comes out as I expect, everybody calms down a little bit, the dollar retraces to, let's say UUP comes back down to 2760. This is a hypothetical, but I think it's actually pretty reasonable. So it comes back to about 2750 and then pops up again. That would be a buy opportunity there. Because it, what it does is it helps to diversify both strategically as well as on an asset basis, the, your overall exposure in your portfolio. It's not going to reverse everything, but it will help to smooth things out quite a bit. So th this is one, what I think is a very obvious way to do it, but your time horizon when you're trading a derivatives-based ETF should be fairly short-term because they do have this error that is basically an embedded cost to you, so it's kind of a problem. However, there are other things to do as well. So I mentioned uh, last week we went through several specific strategies to what, what if we wanted to, to strategically diversify. So if we're a bit bearish and we wanted to strategically diversify and take advantage of a weak market and the macroeconomic environment is causing that, I think this, the specific strategies that I said last Monday were shorting bonds, right? Or buying an inverse bond ETF, uh, shorting utilities, right? Um, shorting, I want to say, see, I know there was a third that I was spending. Somebody remind me. Um, well, I, I, anyway, the, 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 there were a few ideas there. So utilities, of course, but basically looking at stocks that are likely to suffer even if uh, the rest of the market is not doing so bad, that the macro issues are just huge. So utilities is the classic example here. Well, <clears throat> So there's another factor we kind of ignored last week, which is the stronger dollar. And this is where they present some opportunities to basically take those strategies that we talked about last week that you might deploy a strategic diversification, so not, a, not your whole portfolio, but a portion of it, uh, to short, 
but to add that that uh, factor to your investment decision. So here, here's what I mean. What if there were a way, let's say that you don't like utilities. You think utilities are particularly weak or emerging markets or whatever it is, the or especially retail or something like that, and you want to be able to take advantage of the fact that the dollar is rising. So here's where this gets interesting. So let's imagine that you are running a company and uh, you know, you're, you're, so here's your company, your company ABC, okay? But you are operating in, I don't know, Brazil. So let's say that you're in, you're in Brazil. So your profits are now, but you have a listing, your, your stock is listed in the US. So it, uh, maybe it's also listed on a Brazilian exchange as well. That's certainly possible. Uh, but you have a stock that's listed in the US. So they think about like Volkswagen or um, Alibaba or whatever. You know, they have, they're, they're Chinese or German or Brazilian or whatever, but they also have a version of their shares that are available in the US. So what happens is that uh, your revenues and your profits are in the domestic currency. So let's say that, uh, you know, for what, whatever your profits that you brought in, you have 1,000 units of profits, okay? So 1,000 units of profits, but your investors in the U.S., what do they care about you? What terms do they want your profits in? Dollars, right? So you have to think about this as, okay, well, uh, maybe, uh, maybe three months ago, maybe we were at parity, that 1,000 units of profit in my domestic currency was 1,000 uh, dollars of, of, of US dollar profits. So there, there was no problem there. But then the dollar is appreciated in value so much relative to certainly emerging markets, currencies, uh, uh, European, Jap Japanese, so forth and so on, that now the problem is you're converting your profits into a stronger dollar. So it takes fewer dollars to buy your profits. Your profits are now, they're, they're not coming over at parity they're now coming over at a, at a significant disadvantage. So then now they're coming over at, let's say, $800. If the dollar is appreciated 20%, then that means your profits, no matter how good they were, have actually been uh, damaged by that. So the, the idea is to use the same principles that we discussed last week of you know maybe utilities or specialty retail or unprofitable companies, whatever. And I got a couple of examples to show you, or tech or you name it that are in trouble, that are unattractive for a lot of other reasons. And then on top of that, if the dollar continues getting stronger, or even just stays where it is, whatever profits they are able to make are worse. Whatever losses they make are even worse because they're being translated into dollars. Okay, so uh, I'll give you a couple of specific examples. So I was looking around and I thought, okay, well, what about utilities? So here's one Latin American uh, uh, utility. Actually, this one's in Brazil, now that I think about it. It's probably why it was top of mind. So Brazilian, uh, it's a water utility. And you know, hey, you can think about it like US utilities, very similar in uh, the way that they work. And as you can see, breaking support because of everything that they have working against them is the same as what we, domestic companies are dealing with right now. In addition to the fact that their profit reports are having to be translated into a stronger dollar. So SBS is one that popped to mind as a utility. So I'm just generating a few ideas. Some of the things you could search for uh, so especially retail, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, so, uh, I'm a runner and I'm constantly looking for good shoes because as I'm getting a little older, I'm more concerned about that. I like to run every day. And I recently bought some shoes that I actually really liked. Uh, they, and I don't know, I don't know how to say the brand name, but they're on shoes. They have like that weird kind of logo. So this is a Swiss company. They make these shoes. I mean, of course, they manufacture them in Asia, but uh, so a Swiss company, they make running shoes and apparel, things like that. The, but the problem is that their, their profits are mostly denominated in uh, Swiss franc or the euro. And you get a issue here where specialty retail, number one, apparel, number two, transportation problems, and three, the currency working in them. And four, they are, I mean, I like their products, but they are unprofitable. So there's a company that have not figured out how to actually turn a profit uh, in a market that can be pushed around pretty easily by companies like Nike. So th this is one that popped out in my mind as a pretty obvious one as far as how can I put this in my favor? How can I uh, use what is a disadvantage currently uh, in my favor? Okay, I'll do one more. I'll, let me do one more. You know, I was going to do Alibaba. Yeah, yeah, I'll do Alibaba anyway. I, I uh, talked a lot last week about Alibaba and how bad it is, and I stand by that. This would be, 
so I won't belabor it. This is another classic example. Tech, um, they are profitable, but tech, uh, the shares that you buy in the US are not Alibaba shares. They actually have a claim on nothing. They're just from a holding company in the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Bahamas or uh, I'm trying to think of the, oh, it's just flown out of my head, but the, the, this is not a, when you buy shares of BB, BABA, you are not buying any claim on their earnings whatsoever. So uh, it's a huge problem. And they are translating their earnings, such as they are, to, into a stronger dollar. Now, it's not as serious a problem with China, but, uh, or BBVA, which is a, uh, now this one, you'd think Argentina, but it's actually a Spanish company. And so their, their profits are in euros and then being translated into dollars. But this is one, and actually those of you who've known me for a long time, you know I pick on these guys a lot. So BBVA, they're always a class, they're always one I keep in my short portfolio. As far as anytime I need a little bit of strategic diversification, I go after these guys. I should have mentioned them last week because this is a good one. The, uh, but financial companies in Spain, Portugal, Greece, Latin America, as you can imagine, have a particularly rough time when, uh, when market conditions are getting worse in the U.S. And this puts those kinds of things in, the, in their favor. So what I hope to do is generate a few ideas as far as how can I take advantage of a stronger dollar? Well, foreign profits are worth less. This goes for multinationals as well. So if you think about uh, just companies that make a lot from the international sales, like uh, let's say a Harley Davidson or, or well a Ford. Ford's a better example than that. That's going to be a headwind for them. It's not as bad, but it is it is definitely going to be a headwind for them. Okay, so I'm going to pause here for a second and go back and answer a bunch of questions here. Okay, let's see here. So I'm going to go back towards the beginning. And work my way forward. Okay. Uh, is it right that one, uh, rising dollars creating opportunity in commodities? Mm, I don't think that's right. A strong dollar can hurt emerging markets. Yes. It hurts emerging markets because, uh, I mean, yes and no. It, a stronger dollar can do a lot of good for emerging markets because it makes emerging market exports cheaper, right? So, so as the dollar rises in value, it is cheaper to buy things, let's say, from China and India and so forth, right? So, so that's good, but unfortunately, um, it, can, it, the, it can also have a negative effect on the U.S. economy, which then reduces demand. And, and that's ultimately what kind of the Fed is trying to do. So it can be this offsetting issue. So right now, I wouldn't expect that the positives for emerging markets would offset the negatives. But that is, if the dollar, let's say things were to settle down, but the dollar remained relatively strong, let's say we're looking ahead maybe eight, nine months, something like that. So maybe we've gone through uh, upheaval in the market, things are looking a little bit better, but the dollar is still really strong on a relative basis. That would be very much in emerging markets' uh, favor. So that, that would be when we'd want to uh, strike at that point. All right, let's see here. Are traders pricing in a bad PPI numbers for tomorrow? Maybe, maybe. I mean, it's already expectations are pretty high. Uh, is this the part where we start hearing more about demand destruction? Yeah, I mean, that's a serious issue. Uh, it, it is, uh, I think it's becoming more serious. It's ultimately kind of the objective. Oh, well, part of the object, objective of the Fed in order to reach price stability is to try to destroy demand. Not, not in the sense of, completely eradicate demand, but to tamp it down a little bit. Now, one of the most effective ways that they can do that, so we're back looking at S&P 500 right now, is by raising rates enough that mortgage rates start to go up, right? So mortgage rates are going up a lot. Mortgage applications are down, home sales are down, everything's down in the real estate market. So if the rate of change of housing prices dropped, right? So it doesn't even have to go negative. Home prices don't even have to drop. The, then our inflation measures would drop a lot because if you look at like PCE or CPI, well, a third of those, of those measures are housing costs. So if the Fed is able to just nudge mortgage rates enough, I mean, they're selling mortgage-backed securities like crazy. That's going to raise mortgage rates. They are, of course, raising the overnight rate, which is kind of flowing through to the other long-term rates. That's raising mortgage rates. The, then you got a third of our most important inflation measure is housing. So if we can bring housing inflation down, then that all of a sudden your main inflation rate is down significantly. So that's 
You know, right now, I think they'll probably pull it. And and how are they doing that? By destroying demand for housing. I mean, or at least, let's say, giving demand a haircut in, uh, 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 by raising rates. Uh, what signal are we to look for before putting serious money in the market? Um, do we look for fundamentals and earnings that surpass expectations? Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you'd look for, yeah, earnings growth that surpasses inflation would be, I think, reasonable. Um, the, you know, I was asked the other, mar- the other I want to say maybe three or four weeks ago, how do you avoid buying false bottoms? And my answer at the time, I want to say it was probably a month ago, the, when we were last at about 3900 And my response at the time was, you know, on your way down, you buy a lot of false bottoms. And that's true. So I tend not to wait. And as a result, as I'm putting money into the market, sometimes I buy a false bottom. More often than not, I buy the real bottom. But in a market like this, I bought, I bought some false ones. So, And it's just kind of one of those things you take when, the, when it comes around. So if you look at the market historically, and sometimes we get stuff like this, but this is the, the exception of the rule. So, uh, But to your point, uh, any, any kind of – I wouldn't even look for earnings. Like you mentioned Johnson & Johnson, Walmart, and so forth. So let's, let's pull up Johnson & Johnson. That's, I think that's actually a really good bellwether. I, I really like that idea. Johnson Johnson's a good one. And you're saying, should we look for Johnson Johnson's earnings growth to be above uh, inflation? I would say no. I would only look for the rate of change of earnings to be positive. So, so or the, the rate of change of change, right? So here's what I mean. Let's say that we're expecting earnings to be up 1% in the second quarter compared to the second quarter last year, right? So the rate of change of this quarter compared to the same time last year is 1%. But then what if we go to the next quarter and suddenly the rate of change of the rate of change is, is getting better? So now we're expecting, hey, we think third quarter is gonna be up 3% compared to last time. And fourth quarter is up 5% compared to last time, right? So that would be an accelerating rate of change. That's what we want. And I know that's a little weedy, but uh, that's what I'd be looking for. And we don't have that right now. That is not, uh, we are not in that situation currently, unfortunately. Um, how likely is it that we drop to the 20 week simple moving average on the major indices? Are we not there yet? Um, let's see, let me just shift this around a little bit. How likely are we? Wait, wait, wait. How likely is it we drop to the, oh, 200 week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, it's not, it, if the Fed disappoints on Wednesday, I mean, that's kind of my worst case scenario is about where the 200 week moving average is to answer this question. I would still put a low probability on it, but, um, uh, but yeah, if the, I mean, if the Fed disappoints on Wednesday by raising the rate, or maybe they don't, but they come out, you know, fire breathing threats in the press conference that we're going to just hike rates until the economy is screaming, whatever it is. I'm being hyperbolic, but, you know, they might want to message something fairly hawkish. Because if they do that, you know, then yeah, hitting the 200 week moving average would not be a surprise. That's, that's in fact a little above my worst case scenario in that, in that event um let's see here is is anything like a soft landing still an agenda item yeah i think so i i actually think that there's a i mean we had we, we have experience with that think about 2015 so think about 2015 and 2018 those are good examples 2019 so those are good examples of soft landings 2015 very volatile very volatile i uh, went through an earnings recession not a full economic recession but the the fed managed monetary policy and of course the pretty effectively and there was uh generally uh economic production was was improved so both 2015 is a good or 2016 i should say and then early 2019 are classic examples of soft landings why do we not talk about them because nobody remembers those they were they were non-events right but those are good examples of that they were very similar situations economically speaking outside of the inflation issue uh, to what we're in right now. <clears throat> uh, effect on gold prices. 
Short term, bad, long term, good. So gold is priced in dollars. The dollar is getting a lot stronger. Gold's going to drop. That's what, it, that's what happened today. Additionally, gold, so I'm looking at GLD right now. This is GLD, which is an ETF that buys gold, for those of you that may not have known that. Uh, so GLD, uh, as uh, gold competes for yield, so if rates are going up, that's bad for gold as well, at least short term, not long term, but short term it is. And uh, that's, why, that's why you're seeing the kind of behavior that we're seeing right now. I mean, I think there's enough uncertainty in the market that that's helping to support prices a little bit. And you would think that inflation is a good thing for gold, but short term, it tends not to be. So, uh, I mean, gold has dropped significantly during highly inflationary periods. And um, so it, it can have kind of a weird relationship with inflation. But uh, I think uh, in the more intermediate term, gold will probably rebound. So I don't think this is a, a deal killer for gold. Uh, let's see, oil and gas stocks we're selling today. How do you see them? So positive. Still positive. I don't have anything to add on that front. I might, I still am in favor of companies that are, you know, more in the natural gas area. So I use Devon Energy because it was top of mind. The, you know, everything's selling off, but I think, uh, I think oil, particularly gas, looks good. So if I were trying to determine something, you know, Devon's good or Chesapeake is very interesting. You know, I look at Chesapeake right now. If it's, you know, it's right at those prior highs. I mean, we got an excursion today, but it was a panic today. So you got to weight that properly. I mean, if it rebounded, that looks like a very interesting dip on just using Chesapeake as the example. So I, I still like that sector. I wouldn't get too overweight to it because if things calm down in Ukraine, I mean, you know, you never know, then that would uh, have a pretty... Sh uh, dramatic short-term effect on those prices. So I'd want to stay nimble, but yeah, that, that looks, still looks good to me. Um, let's see here. Uh, to say the White House does not control inflation, but the Fed, did I say that? But the Feds do, seems disingenuous. Uh, I would, however, I would say, because if you think about supply, right? If you think about supply, I mean, what drives inflation? Well, fiscal and monetary policy, right? I mean, we can agree on that. Fiscal policy is the government and monetary policy is the Fed. But the power of the purse is with Congress. So if we want to yell at somebody, I'd be yelling at the Senate and Congress. But uh, I mean, yell at them all. Yell at, it, they deserve an even a distribution of yelling at them. But I didn't mean to mislead if I have said that the White House didn't cause inflation. But I would say that certainly Congress and the Senate have contributed significantly to the inflationary problem that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, fiscal spending... That's a huge issue. All right, let's see here. Um, are there any signs of TBT slowing down? No, I don't think bonds are coming. I don't think bonds are going to start to rally anytime soon. I bought some stocks today when they were so down and then they came down more. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. I feel that. Um, John, could you please give us some downside target? Okay, I hope to have provided a little bit of that. Uh, honestly, I've been a little bit vague because today's a panic day. So you get kind of runaway markets are, your estimates are going to be error prone, right? So we are going to be doing a market update tomorrow. It'll be pre-recorded like we did last week, kind of doing this little test. We can give you more frequent updates. So um, uh, look for that. I think we'll, it'll, an extra day will give me a little bit better ideas to, okay, how realistic is it that we're dropping further or not? Uh, so look out for that tomorrow. I think we'll be able to get into a little bit more detail then. And then Wednesday for sure. So we'll also do a market update on Wednesday. We'll talk about the Fed. And that's when I think we'll have a really good idea. Um, let's see here. So Powell will speak on Friday. Any expectation for that if the minute meetings after the... So it's not the minutes that are out. It's the actual rate announcement that will be out on Wednesday. Um, so something new he would say on Friday? No, I mean, he'll, he'll probably get most of it out on Wednesday. <laughs> uh, so the opposite of buy the rumors, sell the news, right? Now we have for the Fed's news to buy. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, the, the, the percentage of times the market rallies the day after Fed announcements compared to any other day, any other day during the year is disproportionately positive and is a very high percentage. I haven't updated that study in quite a while. But the last time we looked at that would have been about 2020. And it was like 
So now I'm not saying that we should infer from that statistic for Thursday, but but I would say that historically that has been the way it plays out, that the Fed does a lot to try to calm things down. Um, let's see here. Uh, how about political pressure for the upcoming elections with most retirement accounts being obliterated? <laughs> yeah, asking the best to have an extra soft landing that never happens. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, that's what the, during the Nixon administration, that's what they were doing. Yeah. They were the, I mean, it's supposed to be a, a Chinese wall between the two, right? But, um, monetary policy versus the white house and so forth. But, um, I mean, of course that's not going to be the case. So there, there may be some back and forth going on there. I, I have no idea how we would characterize it right now. Um, let's see here. John, if you don't look at what the true definition of recession, wouldn't you say we are in a recession already? No. Um, I mean, I don't know how I would define recession outside of the definition of recession, right, Rob? I think I feel... I think I get the feeling of your question. Like, I think I understand where your question is coming from. So in other words, do I feel like the the rate of economic growth is contracting? Yes. Um, am I concerned that we could go into recession? Yes. The Are we in recession right now? I mean, no, as recessions are defined. Uh, but um, but are we, are we getting that feeling because we're headed there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what we would call it. Pre-recession? I mean, it's not a good thing. Uh, let's see here. Remember the Swiss franc. I'm not sure if I fully understand your question, but um, any thoughts on Adobe going into, uh, I mean, other than the Swiss franc is sometimes a safe haven investment. That's true. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on Adobe going into earnings this week? Yeah. A high PE stock in this environment could be trouble. Although Oracle, I'm so glad you brought up Oracle, Greg. I'm with you. I'm with you. So, okay. So any thoughts on Adobe? So I like Adobe. They are beaten up like crazy. Uh, you know, the Oracle announcement came out today and it was it was fairly positive. I wonder what the post market looks like on it. Let's let's take a look. So Oracle. Um, all right, so here's Oracle. I just turned this into a five minute chart. So Oracle's announcement. So there's the post market. So that's that's this afternoon. So that's the market close. Market uh, closed right there. So they gave their announcement out and they're up a uh, fair amount. So 63 to 73. Wow, geez, that's pretty good. That does bode fairly well for Adobe. Interesting. I wonder, Adobe's probably up a bit in the post market then. No, interesting. Adobe's very interesting. So anyway, uh, I would suggest that um, I have not read the Oracle report, so I haven't gone through it in detail yet. It's, it's pretty fresh. But if I were looking for companies that would benefit from the same macro sector factors that have benefited um, Oracle, I would put Microsoft and Adobe at the top two on my list. So accumulating and any kind of a dip here seems pretty tempting. <clears throat> Let's see here, Terrence. Hey, Terrence. Uh, John, the U.S. dollar is the safe haven for now, but later in this year, we're going to be dealing with another debt ceiling issue, right? Where would investors flee to then? The dollar. I know it seems weird, but yeah. Yeah. You have to think about these things in terms of like, because the instability in the U.S. Now, this is not always going to be the case, right? But And, and it is changing over time. But right now, if there's a debt ceiling crisis in the U.S., it's kind of a debt ceiling crisis for the world. I know that sounds very, you know, ethnocentric because I'm here in the U.S. But that's just the way that it is right now. It's probably not going to always be that way, but that is the way it is right now. So it's not like a problem in the U.S. It's just a U.S. problem. It's a global problem. There are only so many economies. That, so think about, like, for example, the Greek financial crisis, right? The Greek debt crises. So even there, you know, we're so intertwined, even there where the, it was, you know, mostly isolated to Greece, uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, the, it was, we kept having these rever reverberations even here in the U.S. Uh, from that. So it, it's, it's still going to be a, a dollar world, at least it, it, with the, even with a potential debt ceiling crisis. I'm not going to hold my breath, however. I think this one's going to blow over fast like the last one. So and I, I was on record at that time saying that I thought it was they were going to get that one resolved pretty fast, and they did. 
the anytime economic conditions are really bad, nobody wants to get blamed for that. And that, and that has been something that, uh, you know, a lot of economists have pointed that that the original debt ceiling crisis problem as the reason why those midterms went the direction that they did. All right, let's see here. Um, are there European assets like our REITs that we can buy with, uh, with dollars? Yes. Yes. Um, you'd have to screen for them, but, um, but yeah, there are international REITs. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, what about commodity ETFs like DBC? Uh, so commodities, you have to remember that, um, you know, commodities are priced in dollars. So right now, uh, the dollar is not dragging, a stronger dollar is not dragging on them as much as uh, we would be worried about because uh, commodity uh, ETFs like DBC, the one you're asking about, are so heavily weighted to the energy sector. So as long as energy, as long as oil is going this direction, then the dollar is going to drag on it a little bit, but it's not going to be a huge problem. Uh, but if oil were to pause, then the stronger dollar is going to hammer down. The additional, and I would have to say, it's it's not just in the energy sector, but also soft commodities have been inflating very quickly too. This is a weird situation because normally this would not be the case. Which, you know, what I would infer from this is if there's any kind of success at controlling inflation, or if energy prices start to come down a little bit here in the short term, then some of these commodity ETFs like DBC they do look pretty overpriced. It's one of the reasons why I say stay flexible in the energy sector, but I think there we're got a little bit more stability. Uh, a pure commodity play is probably going to be a lot more delicate. So I, I would just be, I would just set expectations that way. Um, let's see here. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. John, oh, after hours. Oh, Kevin, you sold cover calls on Oracle. Yeah. Uh, o N O N and manufactures in Vietnam. Thanks. I think I, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. Nike pushes like a bully. Yeah. Uh, the IPO price was twenty four dollars. Okay. B B B A. Oh, BBVA, lie about the dividend. Oh, I haven't looked that up. I, I don't know much about it. Let's see. All Chinese ADRs are shell companies. Cayman Islands. Oh, thank you. That was the name I could not come up with. What did I say? Bermuda? Something like that. Uh, is there another currency also getting stronger and compete with the US dollar? So the Swiss franc does a little bit. So for example, um, so let me pull up the dollar to the franc. So the fact that this is rising, what that's telling you is the dollar is getting stronger relative to the franc. But on a, if we were to, let's say, exclude the dollar, so one of the ways we can do that is we could compare. Uh, this is getting very weedy, but I think it's an interesting conversation. The, we could compare the dollar to the, or sorry, the euro to the franc, which that's this chart here. What this is telling you is, because this is dropping, that's telling you that the franc is getting stronger. Uh, not a lot. I mean, the euro and the franc have actually been pretty stable. Look at that. That's really been quite stable. Uh, but here, just very recently, the franc does tend to be a hedge. I think this is, this is becoming less and less true uh, over time because the, I mean, the, the Swiss National Bank, so their version of the Fed, basically, you know, a decade ago, turned over monetary policy to the European Central Bank. I mean, not officially, but unofficially they did. So I think that investors have a harder time seeing the difference between the two of them right now because of that. But, you know, I, that's probably still a small issue that should be in favor of the, of the franc. But there really isn't anything else that's like that. It's mostly the dollar. In a market panic, it's mostly the dollar. All right, let's see here. Expectations for Kroger earnings, for Kroger earnings. Um, it's a good question. I, I am concerned about inventory build, but not to the extent that we saw with like Target and Walmart. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's just such an unknown right now. I would be more optimistic. 
I'd be more optimistic than uh, I would be with another discount retailer. So with Kroger, but let me rephrase the question. So what if you asked me, would I buy Kroger before earnings? No, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd buy any uh, retail right now before earnings. So, you know, I don't think retail is a bad play, but, um, but Kroger, yeah. Fundamentally, they're not super impressive. They're okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Bernanke said today the recession is coming, but it may not be too bad if we've seen a good recession yet. Yeah. <laughs> Can we say we've seen less bad recessions? Um, is it time to short the European market? Yes. Uh, I'd be selective, though. I think you can afford to, you can afford to be selective. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how do you see the VIX? Not high enough, not enough panic yet. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know a lot of traders are convinced the VIX is broken, but I, I don't subscribe to that. I think investors are pricing in their expectations for volatility. And uh, it's high, but it's not at... And when I say today was a panic day, I believe that. But it was not a forced selling day. This was not like a fiscal cliff day. The, uh, it was a bad day for sure. Got into the feedback loop. You kind of hit that, hit that border. But, um, but would I say that it was like a full market panic? No, because a full market panic is, is triggered by forced selling, meaning that big investors have to sell. The, and today was not one of those days. So when that happens, that's where you see the VIX just go totally berserk. And right now, it's I think it's at an appropriate level. It's if we're trying to price inflation or volatility for the next thirty days, I think that's about right. I mean, this is on an annualized basis, so you'd have to. Uh, so if we took the twelfth root of that, that'd give us our that'd give us our ex, what they expect for the for the next um, thirty days. Um, let's see here. Uh, speaking of these inventory metrics, speaking financial statement wise, what are the financial ratios you suggest we look at? You know what? I'm going to end on this conversation. Terrence, such a great question. This is I, genuinely, this is super insightful. If anybody's not paying attention right now, this is one of the best questions I've had in a while because it is something that you cannot get easily. Well, actually you can, I'll show you how to get it. So Terrence is basically asking a question. Hey, you're, you're talking about this inventory stuff, inventory build and so forth and so on. Is there a way, is there a financial metric for us to find this? Uh, there's not, they don't report it like that. So, uh, but there is something that you can do. So there is a measure called the cash conversion ratio. This is a little weedy. I don't have time to fully explain the whole thing right now. So I'll tell you what, I will, I will show you how to look for the cash conversion ratio. Uh, uh, let me see here. I will show you how to how to search for it, and uh, and then I can spend some time on it tomorrow during the market update because it's such a good. So the cash conversion ratio basically tells you how long is it taking for a company to convert um, to convert their cash outflows into cash inflows, right? Inventory is a major component of that. What, doesn't that make sense? Because they have to outlay cash in order to get in, into inventory. They don't want it to sit very long. They want to get that cash back out of it right away, right? So when you know Target, Walmart, and so forth, they are dealing with a bad cash conversion ratio right now. So how do you find this information? Well, I can tell you this is one of those things that professionals use that retail investors do not know anything about, and it is one of the most predictive fundamental indicators out there. If you have a positive, if you have a good cash conversion ratio, that means you that tells you a lot of really good things about that company, not just inventory, but it's it is definitely inventory. Go to learningmarkets.com. It's all free. Go to the screener. Uh, you can select create a, I'm going to create a screen, but we have, I've got pre-builts that also look at it. And um, we have the cash conversion ratio. So let's see. Uh, and in fact, not just the, oops, wrong, wrong thing. Not just um, the, uh, why am I not seeing it? Sorry. Okay. There we, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Cash conversion cycle. I kept saying ratio, but I meant conversion cycle. 
Okay, so cash conversion cycle, and what we look for is the trend of that cash conversion cycle. You want it to be down. You want them to be taking fewer and fewer and fewer days to get money out of the money that they are spending. So when they spend money, if they're getting it back in a day, great. Especially if it took them five days the year before or something like that. So we can look for uh, stocks that have, so here I'm, I'm looking for stocks that had a cash conversion rate uh, cycle that got lower in 2020, even lower in 2021, even lower over the trailing 12 months. And we can, uh, we can take a look at the, at the stocks that pop up. Now I didn't put anything else in here. And most of these, they're not gonna surprise you. Aflac, Adobe, Apple, makes sense. Applied Materials, sure. The ATBI, but they're being bought out. Uh, BDX, that's kind of interesting. Brown Foreman is very interesting. I, I'm still in very much in favor of like adult beverage companies right now. So that would be one of the ways that you can look for it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to be able to fully explain this. So maybe I could just whet your appetite. This is a super cool concept that is, I mean, you got to subscribe to a Reuters platform in order to get it, or you got to calculate it yourself in a spreadsheet, or you can just go learning markets all free and pull it up yourself. So uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on it in tomorrow's update as well, because this is a good one. All right, with that, I'm going to have to wrap up here. As usual, I appreciate everybody. These are great questions. I know I didn't get to all of them, but um, these were all very interesting. I thought they were excellent. And um, uh, in the meantime, as usual, I want to make my appeal. Give us comments, thumbs up, subscribes. It helps us build the channel. Let us know if it's helpful that we're doing the interweek uh, updates on Tuesday and Wednesday. They, we would really appreciate your feedback and leave us some questions on the community page on our channel for tomorrow's market update. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great night.